The Siege of Sunbridge Town. Hello, Wargamers. This video is part one of another series of Wargame campaign videos based on events in my own RPG campaign. It uses elements of traditional map campaigns, specifically movement and siege battles. In this video, I'll walk through the steps to convert the movement of troops on the regional campaign map to the forces that are on the battlefield. All of the resources and tools used in this exercise will be linked in the description and further information, including this entire script, can be found on the Design Journal Substack. And now, welcome to the world of Wirth. The world of Wirth is a setting much like a Hyborian age, with danger at every turn, swords and sorcery magic, demons and mad prophets. Tribes of Mipacop and nomads roam the savannah, while peasants and hedge wizards hide behind the walls of even the meanest Thorpe. A powerful ley line crosses the land, creating transient gateways to the fairy realm. Meanwhile, the influence of demons and the below dark waxes, threatening to cover the world in darkness, a suffocating nightmare that wells up from horror filled dungeons underground. On 14 Sacha, the cracked moon turned red as blood. Just days later, an undead horde attacked the fortified town of Gastello Mugatique, just 25 miles west of Greywatch in Sunbridge Town. This siege was played out in the Blood Red Moon series of videos you can see on this channel. After the fall of Gastello Mugatique, the horde marched on the nearby town of Nulub's Quarry, and the headman of Nulub's Quarry sent a scroll dragon, a flying messenger lizard, to the Count of Loraya and the Rallis Bull. This fantasy role-playing campaign is run using a core of RPG rules from Low Fantasy Gaming by Stephen Grodzicki. The basic rules can be downloaded for free at lowfantasygaming.com. I've created homebrew systems for magic and task resolutions, or proficiencies if you prefer, and the campaign is essentially a playtest of these systems. For strategic level campaign operations, I use both setting up a war games campaign by Tony Bath and the solo wargaming guide by William Sylvester. I will refer to these volumes when I use any of the particular mechanics. Low Fantasy Gaming does have a mass combat system in the rules, but it is much more narrative style than I like. I want to play a war game. I have also created a set of system agnostic basic massed combat rules for these types of in-game situations that are still work in progress. I've chosen to use commands and colors, ancients, for the actual execution of this situation on the table for several reasons. First, I need to play this scenario solo. My FRP game is online via Discord, so there is no way to gather in real life and play the war game. The basic masked combat system is not yet developed enough for solo play. GMT Games has a wonderful set of rules for managing card-driven games like Commands and Colors Ancients in solo mode. There are free print and play download at gmtgames.com. And finally, I need to use the game tiles to represent the units in the battle, as I don't have enough actual miniatures at any scale to do so properly. As mentioned, the complete text of the video and the photos are available on the Wargame Culture Design Journal Substack. I invite you to become a subscriber for full access to the expanded content and free downloads available every month. Paid subscriptions allow me to continue producing these long-form presentations and rule supplements like the basic mass combat system. Thank you for your support. Now, the scenario setup. The 19th of Sacha, the Count of Loraya immediately dispatched a scroll dragon messenger of his own to summon his barons to come to the aid of Nulub's quarry against the sudden threat of the undead horde. These included Baron Fordolf of Quan's Landing, Baron Mayaron of Courtney's Cross, Baron Darien of Thims on Yoban, Baron Graash of Otra Kaspold, and Baron Greywatch. Greywatch and Sunbridge Town. Greywatch was instructed to be prepared for the possible attack of the undead horde, and that the other barons would be coming to Greywatch as a staging point. 
Juan's Landing is just off the map to the southeast. Each hex is five miles across, flat to flat. On good roads, infantry and wagons can travel three hexes or 15 miles per day. Meanwhile, the three Skarn tribes of the plains of Hamul saw the blood red moon as a sign from their ancient god to unite and go to war against the humans. No more would they scrounge as nomads on the plains. Skarn messengers were sent out and it took two days to bring the tribes together. The three tribes, Blood Moon, Starfall, and Stormcaller, quickly agreed on a plan. The greatest war chief was that of the Stormcaller tribe, and he took command. The first attack came at the former town of Zan's Forge, where a fire-breathing dragon from out of legend had laid waste last year, and a small contingent of humans were now rebuilding the castle there. On 19 Sacha, the castle was attacked. The weather was bad, the beginning of four days of rain, and the humans were caught unprepared. The looting lasted through the next day. Before we go any further, I do want to mention that I use an online fantasy calendar app for the Weirth calendar. A week in Weirth is nine days, and a month is four weeks, for a total of 36 days. The calendar itself is free and very intuitive to use, once you input your seasonal information, it will automatically track the phases of the moon and the weather, including temperatures and precipitation. You can find this at app.fantasy-calendar.com. On to the siege of Sunbridge Town. It took two days of traveling in the rain for the Skarn to reach the next closest town, the prison town of Sunbridge at Greywatch. The town's scouts had discovered the approach of the three Skarn tribes while remaining undetected themselves in the rain. Since there were no workers in the fields, Baron Greywatch had ample time to fortify the town. One troop of light infantry was left in the partially rebuilt castle with one war engine, and the rest manned the walls of Sunbridge Town. Castle Greywatch is an ancient pile, abandoned after a great battle 80 years ago. It is currently under reconstruction and is not yet complete. Sunbridge Town is a fortified town with walls of timber and stone. The bridge itself is made with an unknown ancient material, seemingly one continuous piece, which dates back to before the Cataclysm. When the River Yovan was much wider here, as the bridge is much longer than it needs to be. Using the Solo Campaign Mobilization Rules William Sylvester's Solo Wargaming Guide describes a mechanic called the Solo Campaign Mobilization Rules, or SCMR, which directs the gamer to define three tactical choices for the Army General to choose from. A few minutes of looking at your situation could provide several possible options for the General's next action. The author instructs you to write down the three tactical options and roll a die to decide on which to implement. As Game Master, you can look at the competence of the general and decide what ideas he might have. And you can even weight those choices. If you have a general, for example, with low competence, you might give him a three and six chance of making a poor choice, a two and six chance of making a fair choice, and a one and six chance of making a very good choice. When you have both opposing generals needing to make choices simultaneously, write down all six options, then roll. You'll need to have some fortitude to trust the dice and follow the instructions you wrote down. The Scarn Tactical Choices On arriving at the fortified and alerted town on 22 Sacha, the Scarn are unaware of the undead horde only 25 miles to the west. Thus, the Scarn choices are on a roll of one, move on, hoping to surprise the next town. On a roll of two, attack immediately, hoping to storm over the walls, kill and enslave the humans within. And on a roll of three to six, invest the town in a siege, build catapults to attack the walls, and win through patience. The Skarn rolled a five. If they had rolled a one and moved west, we would be doing a much different battle. Human mobilization, 
I used the rules from William Sylvester's The Solo Wargaming Guide for mobilizing the troops of the various baronies of County Laraya. The barons and the count have various traits as NPCs in my FRP campaign, but only some of them are needed for the battle. I determined these traits from Bath's Setting Up a Wargames campaign. I created a command card for each commander, with a set of traits rated 1 to 6 that may have an effect on the battle. These traits are loyalty, popularity, intelligence, action level, military aptitude, military experience, political acumen, and finally a command competency rating from the Solo Wargaming Guide. CCR is a calculated trait. You take the average of intelligence, military aptitude, and military experience. The result is rounded up if the commander has a political acumen of 4 plus, otherwise rounded down, and a plus 1 to the CCR for a commander with an action level of 4 plus. When Count Draash summoned the banners to rally at Greywatch, each Baron was given a set of orders, their SCMR. It is important to note that Count Draash knew nothing of the gathering of the Skarn tribes or the attack on Zan's forge when all of this happened. Each Baron was instructed to gather his own men-at-arms and proceed to the rally point. I rolled on another table in the Solo Wargaming Guide on page 14 to see how long each commander would take to mobilize and get his troops moving. Due to the rain and the storms from 19 to 22 Sacha, I determined it would take 1d3 additional days to gather men and materiel for the expedition. For supplies, each force, uh, each force will have wagons of provisions, water, and arms. Each wagon cube will represent 9 days of provisions for 150 hit dice of men and mounts. Baron Fordolf of Quan's Landing Orders are to take your troops to Courtenay's Cross, join Baron Mayeron, and march to Greywatch. Fordolf's response was immediate, and it took three days to mobilize his men-at-arms. They left on 22 Sacha, arriving at Courtenay's Cross on the 25th. 160 hit dice and two wagons. Baron Mayeron of Courtenay's Cross, orders were to mobilize his men-at-arms and wait for Baron Fordolf to arrive, then depart for Greywatch. Mehron delayed his mobilization by one day, then took only two days to get his men-at-arms ready, one hit, uh, <clears throat> 100 hit dice and one wagon. They were able to depart with the Quan's Landing troops on the 26th. Both units then arrive at Greywatch on the 30th. This turned out to be extremely significant and points to the importance of keeping strict time records in your FRP campaign, and when moving troops on the strategic map. Baron Darien of Thimzan Yovan, orders were to move to the rally point at Greywatch. Thimzan Yovan is the closest settlement to Greywatch in Sunbridge Town. His orders were to reinforce the castle and wait for the rest of the forces to arrive. Darien delayed one day then took two days to get his men-at-arms together and march for Greywatch. 180 hit dice and two wagons. He arrived at Greywatch on 24 Sacha after two days of travel on a good road in good weather, only to find the Skarn already controlling the southern bank of the Yovan River and invested in besieging Sunbridge Town. I determined there would only be a one in six chance the Baron's forces could reach the bridge before being spotted by the Skarn, and they made it. Baron Graash of Otrakaspol had just been murdered by a political rival on the 15th of Sacha. No one else in the Count's court was aware of this development. The rival who took control had no interest in going off to fight an undead horde. She had to gain control of her fractious merchant houses and the rest of populace of Otrakaspol. Chief Minister Shada Rishin is an ambitious and desperate woman, craves power, and believes an ancient secret is hidden beneath Castle Grash. She means to find it and use its power to unseat Count Draash himself. And that will be a story 
for another day. Count Draash mobilized his own considerable forces and was able to march on 21 Sacha. Because of the serious nature of the threat, he led his men out in the rain. They were able to travel at 75% speed due to being on good roads. His small army arrived at Greywatch via the northern bank of the river on 26 Sacha. The siege was already underway and the Skarn had begun their war engine attacks. Because the Count's force was 700 hit dice and five wagons, I determined that they could not evade notice by the Skarn on the other side of the river. This unexpected event will be discussed shortly. Turn 1, 23 Sacha. The weather has cleared and the siege begins. The Skarn invest the town, keeping out of the range of the human war engines, and they begin building their own catapults. Turn 2, 24 Sacha. Under cover of the Greywatch war engines, Baron Darian of Thimzan Yovan, with 180 hit dice of men, arrives at Greywatch, crosses the bridge, and enters Sunbridge Town. Darian has two supply wagons with nine days' provisions for 150 hit dice each. They left seven days' worth of supplies with the unit of infantry stationed in Greywatch Castle. They enter and reinforce Sunbridge Town. Turn 3, 25 Sacha. The Scar and War Engines, eight of them, are completed and moved into range. According to Bath, the engines will take 28 days, which will be three weeks in the Weirth calendar, to make a breach in the wall. Once there is a breach, the Skarn may make a storming attack. On turn five of this siege, various diseases and morale effects will begin to affect the populace within the walls of Sunbridge Town. On turn four, 26 Sacha, the Count of Lariah and his army arrive on the northern side of the river at Greywatch. Scouts have reported the situation to the Count and he must consider his own strategic and tactical options. Count Draash tactical options. On a one or a two, he'll set up camp on the north bank, then prepare a sortie across the river. On a three or a four, he'll march directly across the bridge to take up positions southwest of Sunbridge Town. And on a five or six, he'll march across the bridge, form up for an assault, and immediately take the battle directly to the Skarn. Tactical options for the Skarn. The Skarn don't have any forces on the northern bank of the river, but they can see across to the road where Count Draash's army is marching. The Skarn obviously aren't going to just sit and wait for this army to come to them. The Skarn have some choices to make as well. On a one or a two, they will reposition the war engines to attack the column across the river. On a three or a four, they'll move their cavalry forward to try to gain control of the bridge itself before the Count's army can reach it. And on a five or a six, they will reposition their entire force to attack the Count's army at the bridge and prevent them from gaining the southern bank. Any battle at this point will likely be short, as it is approaching the end of the day. This is the end of the introduction to the Siege of Sunbridge Town. In the next video, we will review the two sides' tactical choices and roll out any combat encounters. We will also roll for the amount of time remaining in the daylight and see what happens. Thank you for watching. I would love to answer any questions in the comments section below. Be sure to subscribe and keep on gaming.